Welcome to Damaging Ignorance. Damaging Ignorance is important because whoever controls your language of discourse controls your reality. Every story has two sides to it. On this show, we challenge the dominant discourse of the week. We challenge the dominant discourse not because our side is right, but because the other side is wrong. We offer you the actual position of things, and we are rarely wrong. And even when we are wrong, it is because we do not choose to be right. Welcome, Professor GK. Thank you for having me. The first principality of ignorance we want to damage is about the Uhuru question. President Uhuru is begging a question. It is a question about authentic nationhood. Is this a bad thing? Why is the argument about inclusion, about us not fighting every five years, a bad message? And if it isn't a bad message, why are the judiciary and the Catholic Church against it? Why are the responses we are getting from politicians and the supposed institutions of law and morality, the judges and the church, why are their responses the correct one? What is Uhuru asking? Well, it's interesting. I think he's proposed to the country that, or he has seen the light. He has seen that politics is a tradition of conflicts and he has seen a way to resolve... A, tra a tradition of conflicts. Yes, and he yes. has seen a way in which to resolve this particular cyclical conflict so that every five years we're not go running into the same issues. Um, I think that the question is whether people are on the same page as Uhuru Kenyatta. Or, or even a bigger question is whether they have understood what he's doing. Yeah. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, that's true. Have they understood what he's doing? I do not think they have understood what he is doing. So they're saying BBI is bad because it is not good. <laughs> or because they've been told by people that it's not good. Yes. Yeah. And part of the reason is because they do not know what they want. Yeah, yeah. You see, Uhuru has begged this question. And he said, country, I just want us to do a few things mm. before I leave. One, it is not proper to have a Ferrari presidency where one man chooses another man and together they get into government and all their ministers are chosen from people we do not even know. That's what he said. Yes. He said I have ministers and the ministers are okay, they have worked well, but these ministers don't have mandate from the people. So he's proposing to country, you African people of Kenyan origin, that instead of having a system where William Ruto and I, that's Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, have the uh, ministers we have chosen from the corporate sector who have, don't have any... Uh, locus. Locus. Yeah. And they don't respond to invitations from parliament. Because... Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're basically... So he's saying, instead of doing that, why don't we take this executive and expand it? Then we have president, deputy president, prime minister and two deputies, and then the people who will come in to be part of government have also been elected from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. That is what he is saying. One, two. He's saying we want to percolate resources to devolution, the devolved units, 35%. Yeah. But we want it to constitutionalize that next time if you have a rogue government coming in, they will not mess up with it. Then he's saying the percolation should go all the way down to the ward level. So the ward uh, MCA can have some money to also do development. Then he's saying we want Senate to have 50% representation. So that representation by women. Yeah. So that whatever amounts of money we are sending downwards, the women have a role in terms of uh, uh, determining how the money is utilized. So the question, that's the question he has begged. Yeah. Now, the churches have come and told us that what he has begged is not right. 
that you, that question should only be begged after 2022. <laughs> but they have not told us why after 2022, mm -hmm. which means that they're executing a scheme. Or what the alternative is for that matter. They never told us what the alternative is mm -hmm. for that matter. In the meantime, the same churches have told us a while ago that the solution that Uhuru has given us is the one that should run. So if Uhuru Kenyatta has begged the question, regarding all these things, the churches have come and told us everything he has said is wrong. And um, the judges have also told us that uh, although what he said is not necessarily wrong, the way he did it was wrong. The same Maraga bag of political nonsense, where you say that process is superior to substance. To substance. They say because of that, we throw this thing away. Now the question we must beg, for now, as photo school government is, how will 2022 look like? 2022 will be a very tense election. And it will be tense because we will not have changed the constitution, one. Number two, it will be tense because Kenyans don't know what they want. And on the note of the 2022 election, the second principality of ignorance that we want to damage is about coming to terms with the reality of our ethnic duality. Two communities have been in power for over half a century. Jomo Kenyatta was in power for 15 years, Moi for 24, Kibaki for 10, and Uhuru will have been in power for 10 years. That is over half a century. Is it right for two communities to continue dominating our politics? Is that a question that should be asked unless we are not a nation? Do you get it? <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this is an interesting one. I think I'm at odds because as much as I, s I, I would like to think that we can rotate you know, a presidency, we are 42 plus tribes. I don't see a situation where we will go around all the tribes and everybody has their chance. At the end of the day, what happens to, you know, Gemma's 5.6 million votes? What happens to the owners of things? What happens to those people who can organize credibly and get their candidate uh, on, a, on a ballot and elect them? Um, I think the idea of majoritarian systems perpetuates this logic of ethnic exclusion. But I think we should lean more towards proportional representation, which means if you are more, you prevail. Uh, are we saying that if a Borana is in power, then the owners of things will not have their interests protected? No, they, they probably will. And maybe they will have put the Borana in place, isn't it? I think that's the, the, rea the reality of ethnic arithmetic is that there are certain kingmakers and they will remain. Our current constitution does yeah. not allow a Borana to become president. <laughs> Just so you know. In fact, our current constitution does not allow a Luo to become president. So you will know. Our current constitution does not allow a Luya to become president. So you will know. Our current constitution only allows an alliance of two communities to continue reigning this country. It's a reality. Yeah. You see, Jomo Kenyatta's deputy president, vice president was? Moi. Moi was a Kalenjin. Mm -hmm. Correct? Moi's vice president was? Saitoti most of the time. No, nah, no, no. Moi Kibaki, Josephat Karanja, and Jos Saitoti. Kikuyus. The president is Kikuyu, the vice president is Kalenjin. The president is Kalenjin, the vice president is Kikuyu. Kikuyu has enjoyed the position of vice president for 24 years under Arab Moy. And they enjoyed, why are you looking at that? Because they, they enjoy, earned their right to. They enjoyed the <laughs> position of president <laughs> for 15 years under Jomo. And position of president for, actually the, the only deviation we had here was under Moi Kibaki. Mm -hmm. Kibaki is vice president for Aluyas, mm -hmm. all of them. And it is because 
of the support he received from NARC, the Danuya Nation. But Uru Kenyatta for 10 years, Kalenji. So the question is, is it right for us to continue circulating these positions between the Kikuyus and the Kalenjis? And that's the question Uru Kenyatta is posing. He posed it in Mudavadi's uh, mother's funeral. The Mulolo Declaration. The yeah, Mulolo Declaration saying, is, is that correct? Now those people who then are opposed to BBI, they are saying that they support the circulation of the two positions between the Kikuyus and the Kalenjins, the PTD. But Uhuru is inviting them to say, okay, if you circulate those two positions like that, at least create a prime minister position and two deputies so that they are given to other people. And then you have people who are elected from the ground up uh, to become uh, ministers and uh, everybody is happy. Yeah, I think that's the magic of BBI. It institutionalizes our politics the way it has been. The, the idea of coalitions and alliances at that level. The third principality of ignorance that we want to damage is about elasticity of democracy. If the dominance by two communities is to end, then it is up to the Kikuyu to break this cycle of ethnic majoritarianism. If leadership is retained in one community, the most populous one, then this is not democracy. What we have is the dictatorship of the majority. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> came up with this. You are the one who talked about the dictatorship of the majority. Uh -huh. It's about Libido dominandi. Libido dominandi, yeah. Can you explain what you mean by that concept? So it's, it's a, a Vegalian philosophy. Um, and Who's Vegalian? Ve Vogel, Vogel. Explain to Kenyans. He was a philosopher. Yeah, it's a, yeah, okay, it's a philosopher called Vogel. Uh -huh. Yes, and so basically he talked about um, the lust for power that people have, the desire to dominate. Um, and I think on the Fifth Estate we've attributed libido dominandi to a certain group. Which group is that? So you tell people. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> the Kikuyus? Yes. So if the Kikuyus yeah. are, they suffer from a disease called libido dominandi, eh? mm -hmm. an urge to dominate. Yeah, rightly so. Rightly so because of the numbers. Yeah. You also say they're the owners of things. Yeah. They own country, basically. Um, and then you are telling them that uh, 2022, we are removing your ability to dominate. <laughs> or to, dominate. <laughs> to dominate, yeah. Uh, what do Kenyans expect yeah. from this? You know, the what will happen is that um, Kenyans will get to know what Kikuyus are made of. Because I have told you guys in the past that Kikuyama, Kikuyus are traders. They don't tell you the price of a potato, they will take the market 15 months before they take it there. They wait for <laughs> when the market will happen and they decide the morning before. And I'm persuaded that uh, what you're seeing from the Gamma Nation is nothing but deception. And they do not deceive because they want to, but they deceive because they were in the Mau War, and war, like politics, is nothing but deception. Mm -hmm. They learned to win that which they could not win uh, by brute force. By brute force, through deception, and um, I so strongly believe that they're deceiving William Ruto. Why are you looking like that? I am. I am listening. I so believe there, and uh, I also believe that they will give William Ruto a handshake. Mm. Yeah. 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 Very soon, and then say, let everybody compete. William Ruto is the one who left the handshake, isn't it? 
this is true. He, he left, he, he took off. And after he took off, uh, Uhuru tried to chase him and tell him, man, please come and, and we work this thing out. He, he left in a half. But now during a prayer meeting for the country through parliament the other day, uh, this guy said we need to talk. Mm. We need to have a truce. Didn't he say that? He did. He said Tangatanga Tanga has stopped Manga Mangaring. Yeah. He said that uh, Reggae has stopped. Yeah. It's time for us to talk. Yeah. Meaning that he has already experienced a truce. Yeah. Some kind of an equilibrium. So let us converse it. He's asking for a handshake. And my hunch is that he will be given the handshake. And once the handshake is given to him, uh, the second level of uh, a political play will kick in. Yeah. Prof, which is that level. Well, they have to each assess who has more to lose or to gain. If you have more to lose, then handshake is it. <laughs> Prof, is it possible that this handshake moment was engineered by William Ruto from the very beginning? That he knew if he's a subordinate, he cannot come onto the negotiating table, but if he leaves and comes with a faction, then he will have a bigger opportunity to ask. I cannot put it past William Ruto to do that. Baruto told us that the handshake was his idea. Yes. He also told us his one, Raila called him, then he went and he called Uhuru and said, Uhuru, Raila wants to talk to you. Yes. And then Raila came and said, why, why would I talk to this guy mm. if I can talk directly to the president? So there is a lot of uh, um, play right there. But does... Uh, your question again. Um, you, you're suggesting that he engineered this yes. so that then he can come back and bargain. With a, with a, with a bigger uh, bargaining position. The question that must be back there is, was he in a better place when he left compared to where he is now? Mm. Of course. Was he in a better place? I think he was. So then that must have been a miscalculation. On, on his part. part. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, I have always said that politicians in this country don't understand politics. It's because they jump into a vessel and just drive it, without necessarily knowing the direction it's going. And William Ruto has done that. But I think uh, because of the prayers he did the other day in the prayer meeting of the nation, what do they call that thing? National Prayer Breakfast. <laughs> I don't know if God will even attend a, a prayer meeting with politicians. <laughs> God is very unhappy with them. But uh, since he made a prayer, it is very likely, my thinking, that uh, he, his prayer will be answered. And that a handshake will happen with him. And, uh, yeah. Prof, even if there is a third handshake, and considering what we've said in the second principality about the duality of the ethnic communities, is it still possible that even if Uhuru gives, uh, grants this third handshake, he is still undoing the oath of 1969? 1969, all the Kikuyus were taken to some space and they were asked to take an oath. My father, my parents were Christians, they refused to do it, like many Christians did not. But those ones who are not, like my uncles, they ate the oath like a nonsense. <laughs> and they said it tested exactly the way the Mau Mau wore oath they took in the 1940s and 50s, uh, they tested like. Um, but then after that, and if you read Philip Chiang's and Joseph Karimi's book, The Kenyatta Succession, they speak about the picky picky controversy. Yeah. Because after that, then there was a divide amongst the Kikuyus. 
from Central, where the Kikuyus from Kiambu, where some people I will not mention come from, <laughs> they went and took another oath. Hey, hey. GK. Mm. And they say that the motorcade, presidential motorcade, shall not go beyond River Chania mm. into Moranga, Nyeri, Kirinyaga, and all that. It shall remain uh, in central. The original oath that they had taken in 1969 was that the presidency shall not leave central Kenya. Mm. But why that is significant right now, the oath of 1969, is that. Um, the presidency is not only living in central Kenya, but it, it, it for, for a fact, I think it will live, and will live for a very long time, close to 30 years. And that's the next time we'll see those motor, presidential motorcades coming into central Kenya will be in about, uh, we are in which year? We're in 2021. It will be 2050. But in the meantime, the period between now and then, you Kikuyus are going to suffer. If you think more in 24 years, completely crippled your businesses, you have not seen nothing. And that is why we need an inclusive constitutional order. Is that what we are saying, Professor? See, the Yemen nation has not posed its question. Yet, we have said that Uhuru has posed his question. The, the institutions of morality have posed their question. Mm. The people have not posed their question because they don't know. And the Yemen nation has also not posed their question. Until you pose a question, and a question, as Albert Einstein told us, until a question is very well articulated, there cannot be answer to it. What is ailing the Yemen nation? They don't know. They just think they're behaving like an old Kikuyu woman who says that I'm aching everywhere. When you ask her what is wrong, she <laughs> says that <laughs> it is it is the body everywhere. Uh, but until the question is properly posed, there will be no solution to the Yama question. The question though is who will pose the Yama question, who will pose the question for the nation. The institutions of morality have posed the answer the president has. Even Raila has posed this question with the uh, uh, Kenyatta. Is it possible that the person who will pose that question is the person who best understands the problem? Uh, pretty much so. The person who poses a question might understand, better understand the question. However, they may understand it, but they don't have the microphone. Mm. So you need a microphone. We could be GK here. She probably is a person who has understood the game question properly. I think Uhuru Kenyatta has also done a very good job posing that question. They just have not seen the light yet. Uhuru has posed that question, but posed it very quietly. It's a question he's constantly asking the Gemma people. Where do you think you'll be after I have left? Mm. And these Gemma people, you ask them that, they're busy like chickens following the, the honey pot of some Karen gentleman. We hope that we have damaged your ignorance and we hope that we have exposed the owners of the Ignorance Project. Finally, we would like to remind you that things are not as bad as they may seem, or are they? <laughs>